people hear the words chronic fatigue syndrome and then they think, oh, isn't that where you feel tired all the time? And it's really so much more debilitating than that. The spectrum disorder, you've got mild to moderate sufferers. Some of those are out of work. Some of them may be a bit more mobile and able to go to work, but still struggling functionally to get through the day. Um, and then you've got the severe sufferers and that makes up 25% of the patient population. Their health is in such a state of decline that they can't even care for themselves because of the fatigue. Have you ever wondered what the road to recovery from chronic fatigue syndrome or ME looks like? Have you experienced long COVID and wondered how it relates to chronic fatigue syndrome and what you can do about that? Well, today I'm thrilled to have Lauren Windass on the podcast and she is a renowned nutritionist, naturopath and author and she is co-founder of Ardaray. Now, Lauren's expertise lies in an area that affects millions worldwide, and that is chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, Lauren's debut book, Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, Your Route to Recovery, offers a unique perspective, which comes from her own battles, and it's really turned into a professional understanding. Her journey has been shaped by her own experiences with chronic fatigue and she's dedicated herself to supporting and championing others on their recovery journeys. So welcome, I'm Louise Digby, registered nutritional therapist and founder of the Nourish Method to Lasting Fat Loss and it's my mission to empower you so that you and your metabolism thrive and you never have to go through diet misery again. So let's dive in and start chatting to Lauren. Okay, welcome back. And I have got here with me Lauren Windus, and I'm really excited to have her here to talk all about her book and talk about fatigue and try and get as many pearls of wisdom as we can out of you. So welcome. And perhaps we could start by you sharing a little bit about your personal journey with chronic fatigue and how that's led to you being where you are now doing what you're doing and being an author and all those things yeah absolutely so yeah my journey very much started god it was over 10 years ago now so back when I was 19 so this was in 2012 I was essentially going into my second year at university and I remember it being September time and we'd just gone back we were about to start lectures and I just remember catching a viral infection and it was one of those infections that just absolutely floored me you know you kind of never felt so rough I was throwing my head over these um, bowls of steaming hot water and all that oil and trying to clear my sinuses and just really felt rough and I remember it lingering for like I'd say about three weeks um, and then at that point I ended up taking some time even though I'd literally just gone back and we were about to start the semester taking some time out because it just wasn't shifting and I felt horrendous. So I basically took a couple of weeks back home, went to Yorkshire where my parents live um, and I remember kind of resting up. I cleared the kind of acute viral symptoms and then I remember going back to uni thinking that the rest was on its way out but it was a classic kind of never been well since situation. So I was like, I've gotten rid of like the stuffy nose and that sort of thing. But actually, like I was turning up to lectures half asleep. Then as I was going into lectures, I was going back to have a snooze afterwards. I was waking up with muscle and joint aches and pains. I had digestive issues, which I'd had prior, but then they'd gotten a lot worse. So, yeah, it was kind of classic, never been well since. And essentially going around the houses with doctors and really not finding a lot of answers. I remember seeing the words ME chronic fatigue syndrome online as I Google my symptoms, but it was something that I tried to turn my back on a bit because I was so terrified to see that you didn't have a cure and that almost in a way you read all these doom and gloom headlines about it. And I thought, I don't want to be like this forever because it was so debilitating. I remember one of my worst symptoms was a severe brain fog, which almost I just felt like I was walking around in a dream in a daze and I couldn't make sense of reality. I almost felt quite drunk, <laughs> even though I'd not touched mm. a drop of alcohol at that point. But yeah, so long story short, I ended up kind of finding support through nutrition, through kind of functional medicine practitioners along the way. And that led me on this journey of almost in a way putting the jigsaw puzzle pieces back together of what was 
essentially driving my ill health. And whilst I never say that there was one sole thing, that journey that I went on in terms of all the different pieces that I put together really supported me in terms of where I am today. And obviously then obviously training, I managed to luckily get through my degree and then trained as a nutritionist, a naturopath, and obviously hence my interest clinically in working with CFS in any cases. And that obviously was sparked the interest for the book as well to really raise awareness um, and just, yeah, just really champion this community of people. Because I think, especially since before COVID, there wasn't really a lot of awareness about ME post-viral illness. Um, and I think whilst long COVID has done an amazing job at advocating for that, there's still a lot of, that needs to be done in terms of support and awareness. So yeah, that's a little bit about me and my journey. So you obviously had this respiratory infection that led on to become chronic fatigue syndrome slash ME. Do you feel like that was the trigger or do you feel like that was like the cause or were there other things that were part of that as well? Yeah. So most cases when clients come to see me, it's often the case that there is a precipitating trigger, a viral infection. It could for some be a bacterial infection. For others, maybe an immunization, a stressful event or a surgery. But often what can happen is there's always potentially kind of antecedent events that have happened further down their timeline. Mm. Um, and that was certainly the case for me. I'd say that I'd always suffered with um, IBS, so really poor digestive health. It's not something that I really faced up to or addressed when I was younger. I'd say I got it when I was maybe about 14, 13, 14, and just never really faced up to it or really addressed it. And then, yeah, so I'd say that was maybe an antecedent episode. I also had, I remember a stressful event happen. I think it was around that time when I caught the viral infection, actually, because it was basically an ex-boyfriend of mine who was a boyfriend at the time, but it was as though I think we're nearly splitting up. And it was classic first love syndrome where I was just devastated at the thought of breaking up. And I remember that was actually the kind of trigger to then catching this viral infection. So the stress, the poor gut health prior to, and then this infection. So it tends to be the case that there is that kind of straw the broke the camel's back situation but also potentially things littered in the past that maybe accumulate to you becoming susceptible to MECFS, which I think was certainly the case for me. Yes yeah, so that kind of explains why two people could get the same respiratory infection but one person could go on to develop a chronic or sort of a, a long COVID or long type of infection and someone else will just recover and get back to normal. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously we do know this kind of, the way I've tried to describe MECFS is almost like this three-pronged structure of the three Ps. So if you think about it as that there's, well, actually the studies are now showing that there is a genetic predisposition towards becoming unwell with MECFS. And um, there's a huge study in the UK called the DECODE ME study, which is looking into the genetics, uh, all the genetic links of people becoming unwell with the illness. Um, so you kind of obviously have that think and factor in and then you have the precipitating trigger which as mentioned is most likely an infection of some kind it could also be as I said a vaccination a surgery or even a stressful life event or a trauma let's say you've had a car crash or a fall mm. something like that that's that straw that broke the camel's back and then you're left with the these kind of perpetuating factors which are the kind of I guess the needles in the haystack, if you like, the elements that are driving what's going on. And that's this model of dysregulation, which I often describe to clients, which is essentially where you're thinking about your physiological systems almost in a state of imbalance. So things like autonomic nervous system problems or disturbances in the gut microbiome or problems with your adrenal glands or your thyroid to your mitochondria and your immune system. So it's essentially, it is a puzzle. There is a lot we know, but there's an also lot we don't know at the same time. But that's the way I try to describe the complexity of MECFS to people is that you mm. the ge genetic predisposition, the precipitating trigger, and then these kind of drivers, which is often what kind of a lot of my work comprises of is trying to find that needle in the haystack for those clients. Yeah, so it's not as black and white as you get some sort of cause or some sort of trigger and then you go on to get it. There's a lot of different factors that are involved, genetics being one of them. But I assume that even if you've got the gen genetic predisposition, there's got to be other factors in place as well that are going to lead to you developing that. Yeah, very, very much variable factors. Okay. 
So I think there's a lot of misconceptions around chronic fatigue and ME. So what are some of those misconceptions about fatigue and how do you address those in your book and your clinic? So I think the first thing to say when we're talking about chronic fatigue syndrome ME is that it is more than just fatigue. I think there's a misconception that people hear the words chronic fatigue syndrome and then they think that it is, oh, it's just, oh, isn't that where you feel tired all the time? And it's really so much more debilitating than that. And the first thing also to say is that it's a spectrum disorder. So it does affect people on a very different scale. So you've got mild to moderate sufferers who maybe some of those are out of work. Some of them may be a bit more mobile and able to go to work, but still struggling functionally to get through the day. Um, And then you've got the severe sufferers and that makes up 25% of the patient population. Um, And those are obviously housebound, uh, some bed bound, requiring full time care um, because their health is in such a state of decline that they can't even care for themselves because of the fatigue and all of the other symptoms that go with it. And if I had to read a list of different symptoms that come with CFS, most of the, well, the classic symptom that we tend to see is post-exertional malaise. And that is... Essentially, I often refer to it as payback. It's almost that feeling of you've exerted or gone past your energy envelope and then you're left paying for it later with a crash. So your Mm -hmm. symptoms tend to get worse. And it's not to say we're talking about activity like, oh, you've maybe gone and ran three miles or something like that. It could be something as simple as you've walked to the other end of the garden or you've maybe gone to get in the shower for some people. It's different for each individual, but that's definitely one of kind of the hallmark symptoms that is used often to make a diagnosis within the NHS. Other symptoms we see are things like cognitive impairments, so things like brain fog or memory lapses, problems concentrating, sleep difficulties. We see things like food and alcohol intolerances. Gut symptoms are also really common, so especially those that kind of lie in parallel to IBS. And interestingly, there is some stats that that I think it's around 92% of IBS sufferers, sorry, 92% of ME sufferers can also have a comorbidity of IBS. And yes, so there's a huge overlap between gut symptoms and ME CFS, which is very interesting. Things like heart palpitations or shortness of breath and things like sensitivities to chemicals, smells, sounds and light. As I say, that is the common misconception is that it is so much more than just fatigue. And I think when we look at the terms, there's a lot of discrepancy between ME as a word, uh, as a term, should I say, and an also chronic fatigue syndrome, because a lot of the patient population don't like chronic fatigue syndrome because it trivializes the, the nature of the illness. If you think mm. about Alzheimer's disease, if somebody was to say, that Alzheimer's is like having chronic forgetfulness syndrome, then I think there'd be a lot of outcry. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly the case with chronic fatigue syndrome. And then you've got ME. Um, That term was um, given by the Lancet due to an outbreak at the Royal Free Hospital back in, I think it was 1955. And if you actually break down the terms the term myalgic encephalomyelitis, it refers to muscle pain and inflammation in the brain and spinal cord, which whilst maybe there is some subgroups of people with CFS that have potentially that as a driver, it's not a pathologically proven explanation for what is actually going on in the body with this illness, if that makes sense. So Mm -hmm. again, we're just, and if you look at the medical literature, you often see ME forward slash CFS. That is, they're lumped together as almost Mm -hmm. interchangeable. And then you've got some healthcare professionals that would argue that they're separate entities. But the way I try to describe it to people is that, again, because there's still a lot we don't know, if we think of this as almost an umbrella, and long COVID certainly sits within that umbrella, um, is that, you know, actually there might be potentially different subgroups and subcategories within this, but yet we're left with these long and confusing names, which don't really say a lot to explain what is mm. going on. So it's a bit, a bit of a minefield, but I'd say... It's more than just fatigue. Yeah, I think that's so interesting, such a a good point to make because you do kind of assume that someone who is diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, their predominant symptom is fatigue, but it sounds like there's a hell of a lot more that could be going on and it's really more of a whole body thing. Can someone have chronic fatigue syndrome and not have fatigue but have all the other symptoms? Is that ever a thing? 
Not necessarily. You could experience a lot of the other symptoms, but potentially it might be ruled into another diagnosis. But to make a diagnosis, like a formal diagnosis of MECFS, it's essentially a diagnosis of exclusion. So um, as I can read you a list of what essentially need, you need to fall within that criteria of, and this needs to persist for at least three months, along with your doctor ruling out any other alternative reason for your symptoms and of course with fatigue for example I know that you're explaining this in a, as an example of somebody that doesn't have fatigue but fatigue obviously does overlap with a lot of other different conditions mm. um, but no so one of the uh, defining features is debilitating fatigue that's worsened by activity and not relieved by rest and then you've got post-exertional malaise which as I mentioned is that kind of exertional malaise where you will essentially doing any form of activity and you're crashing and that can be delayed in onset by hours or days it's disproportionate to the activity which as mentioned could be something as simple as getting in the shower or walking up a couple of steps uh, and also has a prolonged recovery time that can last hours to days or weeks so yeah so in answer to your question fatigue has to be a kind of key defining feature mm -hmm. to be diagnosed but as I say the symptoms go on and on and above that okay so you talk in your book a lot about a holistic approach to managing chronic fatigue syndrome. So could you tell us what that involves? Yeah, so I think when we're talking about holistic, we're, we're talking about the whole person and we're talking about the various different pillars of health. Um, and that's very much the approach that I took when I was unwell in terms of putting those the jigsaw puzzle pieces back together. But if we think about, as I mentioned, that kind of 3P approach and then specifically the kind of perpetuating factors which is this model of dysregulation which is when you maybe the genetics and the, the precipitating trigger leads you into this this dysregulation where you've got these physiological system imbalances that's where we need to start thinking about the health of our cells the health of our hormones uh, the health of our gut for example because the areas that we've seen dysregulated within CFS include the autonomic nervous system as I mentioned the gut so we've seen decreased levels of commensal bacteria for example um, and dysbiosis problems within the mitochondria and the immune system and also um, low thyroid and adrenal hormones so as I say we could be looking at different subcategories but the reason we look at the holistic model of care is because we need to address various things to almost support homeostasis mm -hmm. so if we're thinking about nutrition it's thinking about how can we support that person giving them exactly what they need to support their cells to support their hormonal health things like their blood sugar and also really support um, the mitochondria as well to really help with the energy manufacture and the energy production in those cells. But then also we need to think about physiologically if the nervous system, which we know is very heavily involved um, in CFS. And we'd see, we've seen evidence of CFS patients being chronically in this sympathetic nervous system activation. So almost this dysautonomia and how we can really support that through the mind-body connection. So again, focusing on mindset. And then we need to think about sleep. So how is that client or that patient sleeping? Are they sleeping excessively during the day? Uh, how are they sleeping during the night? Are they relying on naps to get them through? How is stress impacting them, which also falls into that mindset side of things, but also as well, movement and how are they pacing their activity levels? Because that's a key part of recovery is really working on the balance between activity and rest, mm. uh, forcing them during different stages of recovery. So, you know, if they're in maybe that kind of crash phase where rest is almost, you have almost no choice at that point, but to rest. But then as energy starts to come in, it's thinking about how we can use that sensibly and carefully so that we don't contribute to that boom and bust pattern as we start to then grade up activity. So that's a reason why we need to look at this holistically using this 360 degree approach versus, okay, there's one, unfortunately, we don't have one medicine to fix this. We don't have one diet. We don't have one movement pattern. It's about thinking about this within the whole 360 degree model, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And looking at that person and what's within their reach for making changes so you've mentioned sleep and movement and mindset so where mm -hmm. does nutrition and the naturopathic principles where does that come into your approach so, so I always say there's no one size fits all unfortunately we don't have one solid diet to say this is what will fix CFS ME what we do know is that supporting 
clients from a gut perspective, supporting them from a hormonal perspective is really important. And looking at the diet is, is very important as a facet there. So what I often start with clients is helping them or well, getting them to complete a food and symptom diary to really explore any specific food triggers, because we do see a lot of food sensitivities in MECFS. So often common culprits we can tend to see is things like histamine intolerance, um, which can go hand in hand with people who have kind of the, the immune disturbances, especially if their their symptom cluster is then potentially with a lot of allergy type symptoms, frequent infections, and very run down a lot. Mm. Uh, so histamine is a big one. And then for others, it can be potentially gluten and dairy. See, that can be helpful from lowering the inflammatory load. So anything that we can do to take out any high inflammation that we're exacerbating through what we're eating. So see low hanging fruits would be things like ultra processed foods, high sugar intake, alcohol, of course. And then really thinking about, because I always ask clients, how does a meal make you feel? Does it improve your energy? Does it make your energy feel worse? I think those are key questions to ask when it comes to blood sugar balance. Are they more on the hypoglycemic spectrum or are they more on the hyperglycemic spectrum? And what can we do to really support incorporating more protein and lots more fiber into their diet to really help balance their blood sugar levels? Because we know that blood sugar and energy really do go hand in hand. But yeah, as I say, there's no one size fits all, but really my approach is very much kind of something that's easy to start with because I think you've got to go low and slow low, especially when energy is particularly low, but really focusing on reducing inflammation, reducing the food burden of any specific triggers that somebody's sensitive to, which again is different for everybody and really focusing on blood sugar as much as possible. So I imagine someone listening to this probably is finding it really interesting, but potentially feeling a bit overwhelmed because it might feel like there's a a lot to try and unpick there and a lot that they could potentially be doing. So how can someone who only has so much energy to start working on themselves and, and making some changes, how can they start doing something or kind of turning things around? Are you referring to nutrition or generally? Just generally, really. Yeah, I'd say the first thing to do is, you know, if you are kind of feeling lost, I'd say definitely seek to work with a practitioner. But one of the key things I think to focus on is think about where you are at in that stage of recovery. So there are three kind of different stages I always like to highlight. The first is the crash stage, which is often when you've had that trigger episode where you almost have no choice but to rest because your body is saying we have to rest. There's nothing in the tank, so to speak. So you are just maybe on bed rest. You're not really leaving the house very much and then the next stage is this wired and tired stage which is where energy is starting to come in but it's going back to the nervous system so it's almost where that boom and bust pattern can happen a lot where maybe you find that one day you're feeling a bit better so you go and try and do everything on your list of to-dos and then you're met with kind of that crash as things start to improve and one thing I'll talk about in a minute which is very important if somebody's starting out in this stage is pacing but as things start to improve and as people are then able to recalibrate and reintegrate um essentially what can happen is those crashes get less and less. And that's where we enter this kind of reintegration, restoration phase of recovery, where you're able to function a lot more normally. You're not experiencing the crashes and they become much more distant in terms of their frequency. But pacing, I'd say, is one of the kind of key facets somebody could try and get started with. So one thing I'd advise is people to really explore the daily activities that they're doing. Really do an activity diary to chart where you are on the spectrum of what tasks are potentially energy giving, what is energy draining? What is energy neutral? And how can we incorporate rest buffers into your routine that can really help to um, recalibrate your energy and recoup that? Because if you're giving your nervous system a rest and putting less strain on it, then energy will start to come back rather than put it into that stress response. Because we don't want it going into the fight or flight state. We want it to go into the parasympathetic activity. And that's really key. So keeping an activity diary, trying to do, obviously, there are certain non-negotiable things that tasks that may be done within a day that almost, whether it's cooking dinner or showering, that are the essentials, the non-negotiable. But thinking about how can you incorporate rest buffers around those to really support yourself and also asking the question of if there are tasks that you're doing that are energy draining, what is it about that task that makes it energy draining? Because sometimes it might be that you've done two or three energy draining tasks consecutively. 
Or maybe you've taken the kind of energy from the previous task and brought that into the next one because the previous one was energy draining. Mm. So a good question I ask clients to ask themselves is what is the best state to be in for the given task at hand? Because that can just help to anchor you in terms of, okay, if I'm driving, as an example, I need to feel focused or motivated. If I'm cooking, actually it'd be quite sensible just to feel quite calm and relaxed. This is in your head or worrying about the next thing you're doing. And so sometimes those things can be helpful, but it's also helpful for understanding like like the context as well, because it can change. Are you hormonal or your symptoms flaring in general that day? But really trying to think about two tasks as non-negotiables that you incorporate daily that are energy giving. That could be something like non-sleep deep rest, which is maybe going in a quiet room, closing the door, having no stimulus around you and just focusing on the breath and just really helping to ground yourself. And that's fantastic for activating the parasympathetic nervous system response. Or it could be something creative like knitting or drawing. Anything that gives you energy, I think is important. And of course that will change, but I think doing that process of the activity diary to really just understand what your routine looks like and what is contributing to that boom and bust pattern. And that's how we can look at, and that's obviously where personalized support comes in because that's how we can help clients with, okay, what can we do about where you are at in your routine in terms of how we can incorporate scheduled rest buffers where we need to and chop and change elements that just aren't working. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that and also just focusing on getting your body into kind of a recovery healing state through working on um, the stress response. If you're chronically stressed as a result of what's going on, which is natural, um, that's also important to really work through because even though we know that having a chronic illness is very stressful, especially if you're not able to work or financially able to earn money, um, that's going to impact a lot of things psychologically. But I certainly think working on the stress response really goes part and parcel in terms of recovery and also as part of that pacing model as well. I just want to go back to the the rest buffers that you mentioned. So what does that look like? Is that like stopping for five minutes and having a cup of tea or is it something else? Yeah, so it could be something like, let's say you've got to do a task. There's a task in your routine that's maybe four to five minutes of cleaning the kitchen or cleaning the house or whatever. You could change that up by breaking those tasks down. So maybe it could be 15 minutes in the morning. Then you're doing something else, maybe something energy giving in between some 15 minutes around lunchtime and 15 minutes towards the early evening. So instead of something doing 45 minutes, which physically is quite energy demanding and quite energy draining, mm. you're breaking that up throughout the day and you're incorporating other things into it. And another task that's useful or another strategy, should I say, that's useful as part of that is switching as well. And switching is where you, let's say you have been on your emails for 20, 25 minutes and you're starting to feel like it's becoming energy draining. It's doing something different within that minute of it starting to feel energy draining that essentially demands a different muscle group or a different part of the body. So it could be, okay, you've been using your eyes it's energy draining. So you just, if you you literally just get up, maybe go to open the window, get a glass of water, boil the kettle to make a cup of tea, as you said earlier, something like that. You physically moving your body, do a bit of stretching. So you're moving away from the stimuli of what is draining you. Mm -hmm. Um, And switching can be a great task, even if it's just getting outside and opening the window for five minutes, it can just change your state and physiologically can help shift any stagnant energy within the body. So that's a really helpful tactic. So yeah, I'd say breaking tasks down, changing the way you approach them as well is really important. How, as I said before, how are you thinking about that task? Sometimes we are just in a bad mood mm-hmm. uh, or sometimes we are just drained and that is also very valid and fine but sometimes we can also ask that question what is the best state to be in for the task at hand and there are different mechanisms we can use and strategies to help recalibrate that so that eventually those tasks that maybe were energy draining can become energy building if that makes sense yeah definitely so it sounds like it's about tuning into your body and listening to what it's telling you and if you're starting to feel that that resistance or that energy being drained as time to just take a step aside and, and do something different, even if it's just very brief. I think it is a process of being an art rather than a science. Cause I always say to clients, you know, you know your body way better than anybody, any doctor, any health professional, exactly how your body is going to respond. And sometimes clients that are just starting out the the task of doing an activity diary, they've never had to stop and think 
of all the different miniature tasks that they've done in a day that actually contribute to that boom and bust. And because so people sometimes say, I've done nothing all day. And then actually they've walked the dog, they've done a food shop, they've looked after the kids, they've picked them up from school, they've done all these sorts of different tasks. And they go, oh, I've done nothing. And actually we don't validate all those other things that we're doing that can potentially impact us. But I'd say it's a process of trial and error. And it's something you learn as you go, but it's a process that you start to become much more in tune with your body as you go. And also, as well as all of the physical things that we're doing, I feel like there's often a lot going on mentally as well and quite a high mental load that can be going on. So what role does like mindset and your emotional well-being play in how you address or manage your symptoms? As I mentioned before, when we're looking at CFS, it is this kind of model of dysregulation. We know that one stressful events can precede people becoming unwell with ME-CFS, but also they can be a driving force in the autonomic nervous system dysregulation where we're prone towards being tipped in that fight or flight response. So really working on calming down the amygdala and working on stress reduction through things like journaling, gratitude work. Um, journaling can be really helpful for clients to understand the specific thought cycles that might be going on in relation to their symptoms. As I mentioned, you're having a chronic illness and that's knocked you for six and it's really changed and unearthed a lot in terms of your life, in terms of what you used to be able to, to do and maybe potentially what's not possible at this moment for you. And um, it does cause a lot of these negative thought cycles to arise. And I often talk about these with clients. So we often see things like CFS goggles, which is where we potentially look at the world through a chronic illness lens. Like I'll give you an example. So let's say you've just had a friend ring you and say that they are engaged and that they're getting married and the wedding's going to be in Spain. So instead of you actually being excited at the news of this wedding being in Spain and that your friend has just got engaged, you're already starting to catastrophize around the wedding, thinking, actually, oh, I don't think I'm going to be able to make, will I be able to make the wedding? Or what if I crash? Or will I be able to get all the food that I need there because I'm on a specific dietary plan? And you're already thinking about it through the lens. And that is natural because as a result of having a chronic illness, especially if you're met with post-exertion malaise and frequent crashes, your brain then trains itself to almost try and keep itself safe. So it's looking out for messages of, okay, what's going to trip me up next time? What can I do? Almost avoidance sort of behaviors. So instead of that event, you being excited and being in the moment with your friend who's just gotten engaged, you're now going into chronic illness mode. And whilst that's natural and also valid, it's also not helpful. So it's thinking about how can we reframe that and find evidence to support that actually recovery is possible and there is improvement along the way. And I always say to clients, inspire yourself forwards, but measure yourself backwards. And that's really important to look at where you are from where you were, if that makes sense. So there are other different thoughts that we tend to see. Often A-type personalities tend to be a lot of the client base that I see who ended up with CFSME. Um, not to say that there's a lot of evidence there, but it just tends to be the case that a lot of them are A-type personality traits. And there's a big inner critic going on a lot of the time. I should, I must, I need to, I have to. And often that can drive a lot around recovery in terms of trying very hard to recover or trying to do it in quote unquote, the right way. Mm. And that adds a lot of strain to the nervous system. So unpacking the thought cycles that are going on and really working to think more optimistically and positively around it, not in a toxic positivity way, but more in a gentle way of really looking at where you are and and also saying, because I always say to clients, it's not that you're because people are so heavily attaching their self-esteem to their achievements. And when you're not achieving, that is a big ego bruise for a lot mm. of people. So I always say to client, it's not that your capability has changed. It's just that your capacity has changed and is slightly stretched and limited right now, but that will improve. So I think when people learn that actually they are still capable of doing all the things that they used to do and that eventually they can get back to that, they are still capable of those things. Um, it's just that their capacity is slightly limited right now and it can get back to that. So I think that's such a relief when people hear that and they're like, oh God, yeah, because I think for a lot of people that really 
it really resonates with them to think, oh, actually, yeah, I, I can still do those things. I can still go to the gym. I can still run. I, I am capable of doing those things, but my capacity isn't letting me at this moment. Mm. And that's a really great way to think about it. And, and it's super helpful from a, a stress response, but also from a recovery perspective. And then I always go into kind of beliefs as well with clients is, do you believe that you can recover? Because a lot of the time, I always ask two questions. I say, do you believe that it's possible for people to recover from MECFS? Often they'll say yes to that first one. And then I say, do you believe that you can recover? And then they go, no. Or they'll say yes, but. And then there's always a bit of a, a doubt there. So it's okay, that's interesting. And then we often unpack that because as I say, beliefs are very pivotal when it comes to health. And I would say, your beliefs are simply opinions, but we often treat them as facts and, and they can change and shape throughout life. And I think as we build that evidence that recovery and progress is possible, there's no reason to say that we can't continue to go that extra mile and keep moving forwards. I think it's such a good point because... Now, I see this in my clients as well when I'm working with women who are trying to lose weight. If they don't believe that it's possible for them to optimize their health and, and get to a, a more comfortable weight for them, then they are not going to be able to do it because your actions align with your beliefs. So if you believe yeah. that you're not going to be able to lose weight, then your actions are going to align with that. And there's going to be some self-sabotage happening. Absolutely. But yeah. I, I also see it a lot in people who have chronic fatigue syndrome or irritable bowel syndrome or that kind of diagnosis that is for a collection of symptoms, these types of syndromes, where people just believe that there isn't anything that you can do. And I think often they've been told by their doctors that there's yeah. no treatment or there's no pill. And so you've just got to manage it. And mm -hmm. that must be that must set people back so many years when that happens. Yeah, I, I wrote a bit about that in the book in terms of your views on recovery and if recovery is possible will often be shaped by the first health professional you've spoken to in terms of what they've said to you about recovery. Maybe somebody said that it was never possible to recover and you'd be like this forever. And actually that healthcare professional has a lot to answer for because they're shaping this view where actually they don't have the data to say that. And the way that I talk about recovery is recovery is this upward trajectory towards always being going, moving forwards towards an improved state of well-being. And I'm thinking about kind of the classic key defining symptoms of MECFS being this post-exertional malaise. It's actually recovery is almost being marked by these episodes of post-exertional malaise being less frequent and longer and longer between each episode. And that is recovery. And we apply that to things like eating disorders, to alcoholism, um, to depression. It's not like you don't wake up one day and you're fully symptom free. It doesn't work like that. It's you start to reintegrate and become much more able to function within the, the real world, working world and to do all these things. And that how I describe recovery, even myself, is that I started to be able to look at life through the lens of living my life rather than through the CFS goggles. Over time, that started to diminish and the crashes became less and less. And I built the evidence. I was like, OK, I've been able to do this. And then I was able to run a marathon. Then I wrote my book, all these different things that actually I never thought maybe were possible. And as I say, inspire yourself forwards, but measure yourself backwards. That's recovery. And that's how I like to describe it. But yeah, def definitely shaped by healthcare professionals and, and their views. And mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure it's helpful for people to hear what recovery looks like in the real world because for anything that you're doing whether it's you're trying to lose weight or you're trying to address chronic fatigue syndrome there's always going to be ups and downs and it's going to be a windy route to recovery it's, it's never linear it's never plain sailing but it's about how you um, respond to those challenges that defines your success I think so are there some common challenges that tend to arise for people? I'd say like for, for common challenges, I think a lot of it is in the kind of beliefs system, mm -hmm. not fully understanding or believing that they can recover with it. They might have that belief that other people can. And then it's really working on them 
as I say, getting out of the self-sabotage, if pacing and booming and busting is a big issue, then working on that kind of physical side of things. But also I say to clients, and it sounds really boring and and people probably don't always want to hear it, but it's making friends with patience because and thinking about the positives that you've learned along the way, because there are so many advantages you can gain from making the dietary and lifestyle changes that actually, if you hadn't had the MECFS, that actually arguably you wouldn't have ever learned that you were able to influence your health in such a way from a preventative perspective in terms of all other kinds of chronic conditions from heart disease to cancer to weight troubles. I think it is about a journey and it's different for everybody, but I'd say, yeah, pacing, hiccups, belief block, and and really focusing on kind of patience and making friends with it in a way and focusing on the benefits of what you've learned along the way and actually the amazing abundant health that you will have as you keep going forwards and as you keep putting the work in, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Yeah, it sounds like almost approaching it from a place of gratitude rather than from uh, resentment of the situation that you're in. Yeah, exactly. And it's not to say that having the negative feelings or having the crap days and things like that aren't valid because we all do and it is natural. And it's not to beat yourself up for feeling in any way negative about what's going on because of course if you're not able to work and you're held such a state of decline that it can be really difficult but also it's about really how we can work through those to foster kindness and self-compassion but also to think actually what are the benefits and can we take something positive from this well actually yeah you'd improve your gut health from that you've been able to really support your metabolic health so from a preventative perspective as you continue to recover you've learned so much that maybe this experience would never have given you had you not. And also just from that perspective of avoiding burnout in the future, you realize that you're much more in tune with your body Mm. so that as a result of this experience, that's not going to happen. You're going to really master the art of self-care going forwards because that's naturally how you're going to, to respond as you keep reintegrating back into your life going forward. I always say nobody that has MECFS comes out the other side of it the same person. Mm. And you're often shaped by the changes in habits that you've had, the, the, sh- the shifts in mindsets. But as I say, the person that you come out the other side is actually better off for it. So that's where the gratitude can come in. Yeah, it's a really refreshing way to look at it. Lauren, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been so interesting. How can listeners find out more about what you do and connect with you? Yeah, so no, it's been lovely. Thank you so much for having me on. So yeah, people can find me. So I have a company called Ardere, spelled A-R-D-E-R-E. Um, we are um, a holistic well-being company and we comprise of a nutrition uh, and wellness clinic. We also have psychology services, but also nutrition and functional medicine. So I work obviously with a lot of any CFS viral cases, but more generally women's health or disordered relationships with food. Um, and you can find me on ardere.com or my Instagram handle personally is Lauren Windus Nutritionist, where I share all about any chronic fatigue syndrome and lots of different recipes and food inspiration as well. <laughs> awesome. It sounds amazing. And we'll put all of that into the show notes so that listeners can find it as well. Thanks again. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really hope you enjoyed that episode and you found it helpful on your road to recovery. If you did enjoy it, then please make sure you hit that follow or that subscribe button and you write us a little review on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you like to listen. All of Lauren's stuff is going to be in the show notes and you can also find out more about what I do in the show notes as well. But until next time, I'll see ya.